DC Boxing Legend Podcast. 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 Home of the Champions. DC Boxing Legends, today we're going in a different direction. Uh, I have a special guest. Uh, we usually do all DC fighters, but you know, when you get on a certain level, especially on a national and international level, you develop and meet new friends all through America. Uh, I had the honor and the pleasure of being a roommate and a teammate with one of Cincinnati legends. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have the great Gerald Tucker. How's it going, brother? What's up, brother? Man, it's going good, man. I appreciate you for having me. Man. Always, for man. Introduction. Always, man. Uh, man, you go back to the J.O. days, man, where... 1994. 94, man. man. One of the best teams, according to... I heard Mike said we even broke some records during that time, though. Uh-huh. Mike Stanford was, you know, was a legendary trainer. You know what I'm saying? I see you you still working with the legendary trainer. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Yeah, he brought us together. Yes, indeed, man. And uh, when did you start boxing, brother? I started that year, 94. I was only boxing a couple months before you met me. Like, wow. Met me. Yeah. Wow. And you was ranked number two, wasn't you? Drink number two at yeah, that time. Yeah, I got up to number two. Yeah, after the uh, the JO and the JO box office, I was right number two after that. Okay, um, um, tell me a little bit about yourself, man, and 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 what was it like, uh, in in Cincinnati, man? Because you know, remember we used to have some stories we used to always tell together about how rough our towns was, man. That used to be our thing back then when we were younger. Uh, give me, give me some brief stories about you know, and, and how you know, growing up in Cincinnati and how it, the boxing scenery is out there. Cause y'all have some outstanding boxers that come from out there, man. It's like y'all breed them, man. <laughs> same, same with DC, man. But uh, yeah, as a, as a youngster, man, in Cincinnati, uh, I grew up in a, a single mother household, so we kind of moved around a lot, you know, for her bit, having hard times paying bills living with aunts and grandmas and stuff like that. So it was, you know, all the hood. You know, we never lived in a good neighborhood, so we lived in all the hood. Right. And uh, so growing up was, you know, kind of rough moving around. Uh, at the end, it kind of all came together. I was cool with everybody from the whole city, you know, as far as bad neighborhoods go. So, you know, I had passes to, to do it, please, as you say. But uh, growing up, it's just rough uh, you know you gotta every day walk into school in them hoods you gotta fight down there so or, or you talk your way out of a fight so I, I learned how to fight even before I started boxing man and, uh, I, I wasn't good at, at fighting mm-hmm. but uh, I had I always like went through how a fight would go in my head just in case I had to you know mm-hmm. he's gonna, he gonna, he gonna try to scoop me I'm gonna put on my weight low or he's gonna try to punch him and slip this way so I kind of like was already doing all the mental games for boxing you know just walking to and from school but um, I, what got me into boxing was um, I was playing Little League Baseball and I got real good at it in uh, the worst hood in Cincinnati and uh, about three four years straight I was doing pretty good at that my grades started dropping and um, my mom kicked me off the team so I couldn't play a sport so mm-hmm. I started um, I was real cool with uh, a guy named Ricardo Williams Junior who okay. lived in the same project as me and uh one day I went in the house you know as his mom let me in for company and uh rest in peace to her cause that's yes, indeed. he was recently dead but um I seen all the trophies and plaques and belts he had on the wall it was like took up the whole living room yeah. and uh, all I had was like two little baseball trophies that you know they're about the size of my hands so I was like man I didn't even do what he doing <laughs> so uh, I started sneaking to the to the boxing gym which was you know one block up the street past my house and um, you know before my mama would get off of work and uh, I got real good at boxing in like a few weeks and uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a real quick learner and um, I started putting my grades up like man I really want to do this boxing thing and uh, I brought it to my mom's attention after my grades were up and she was like yeah you can keep doing it 
because it didn't require, you know, her to come to the football field or baseball field. Or, so I could just go up there on my own or with my buddy Rick. So she was with it. So um, that's, and about, that's like two or three months before you actually met me. Oh, wow. But I got real good, real fast. Man, Jerry, you know, I didn't, I didn't know that you started boxing like a few months before that until we were adults, man. Oh, yeah, yeah, man, this yeah, whole like time my, I, I, think thought, I only had, I only had that's my third fight. Man, you I thought you, you had over hundred fight. fights. At that time, I had about at least seventy or eighty. So yeah, I thought you had fight. at least about that with all of us, man, because you was running through that tournament. Man. I had one fight before that tournament. Wow, one. wow, Gerald, that's amazing, man. It's, 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 it, on that level, you know what I'm saying? Especially at that time, man, you know, right? Everybody yeah, could killing. fight. Yeah, and, and for yeah. you to have only a few fights and to, to get on that level, that tell you something about yourself. But man, after that, uh, you know, I stopped fighting in '96. And, okay. Yeah, yeah. After that, I could have kept going. You know, uh, I was, you know, locally and, and going to the nationals. That was not a problem. Uh, we moved well, away. Know, me and my enough to make the um, the uh, open class for the Olympics that year. Or yes, I was. I had four in the Golden was. Gloves, and that was my last tournament. Was the Golden Gloves Nationals, man? Oh, and yeah, um, yeah. we yeah. moved away to Newport News, Virginia. Oh, and that's what yeah. made us. We lost that desire. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we was from the hood, so that's what we was fighting to get out the hood. Right, right. And yeah, once we yeah, was we, out, uh, me, me and AB talk about it all the time. And desire, because he talk about his kids. Like if his kids gonna want it the same way he wanted. It, I was like, you gotta keep that in mind. Right. You no, know, we had we was fighting for different reasons. Exactly. And that really I was, never knew that about y'all. Everybody wondered. You know, yeah, yeah, I know, like, man. Why don't, why don't those dope kids. I had the best papers. That had all the muscles. Right. He's like, where those niggas with the tapers and the muscles? Right. At, man? <laughs> yes, where they, indeed. Yeah, man, they was like some of the slickest fighters in the whole sport. What are they doing? Right. And right. I never, never knew. You know, you never know. Yeah, man. We we just lost the desire, but I I end up coming back to DC, right? And I tried it again, man. And then I, you know, I discovered the almighty female in in <laughs> in, in, in the streets a little bit, you know, dibble and dabble, <laughs> but you no know, nothing serious, but. Wasn't enough to keep me focused in the boxing, and you know how we had that rule. You know, if you ain't can't be halfway in and halfway out, I'd rather if I'm not fully hundred percent in the boxing, I wouldn't do it at all. I respect it that much, you know. Right, right, man. But for you, man, when watching you come up, man, uh, I I was still keeping a, a tabs on the books, and you know how I used to get the USA boxing books and check the rankings and all, you know. Right. And man, I just kept seeing your name one. In two, one and two, one and two, and I was like, my man Gerald's still doing his thing, man. And, and also, I used to see Dante Craig, who was another good friend of mine from Cincinnati. Uh-huh. Man, he was a bad yeah. boy too. He was aggressive. Him. Me, him, and Lil Rick was in the same gym. Us three. Oh, for real? I didn't know whether y'all was at the same gym or not, man. You that same gym. And and, and, that, and y'all was like, we was real tight in in the JOs, man. And I remember. All we would talk about, man, y- y'all used to call it the Natty. Remember that? The, the Natty. natty. Yeah. You know, it's like I'm from DC, man, in the Natty, you know, and but we we <laughs> we respected each other. Right, right, right. On another level, you know, because you know, even though um you know Ohio's is is Midwest or you could consider it Midwest, mm-hmm. it still had an East Coast flavor to it, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And, and um especially for the Cincinnati, the fighting style. Y'all right. boys could go, man. Ricardo was one. I tell people all the time. I think Ricardo one of the best amateurs I ever seen in my life. And I seen Floyd Mayweather, and we we came up with him also. But and right. as an amateur, amateur, right? Ricardo wins yeah. was the best amateur boxer I ever seen in my life. Right. Yeah. A lot of people uh, have to have to call him that. Got to give props where they do. Yeah, but you man, you was winning everything, man. You was fight. You had you had pretty good fights with. Um, I noticed uh, watching through the books you had for it. Sean Johnson from DC, yeah, Clarence Vincent, Clarence Vincent. Yeah, yeah, man. So you you had some you had some battles, man, and you was the alternate on the which team? The, both teams, right? Uh, ninety six. Yeah, ninety six. Ninety six. Okay, and um. 
explain that uh that journey for you for the for the people that's out there listening man how that experience was you for you in Atlanta being an alternate on one of the best Olympic teams I think was around just doing the times of that scoring that was made it kind of difficult as far as meddling but explain that experience man yeah so I was uh, I went into the Olympic Olympia year um, I think I had a little less than 20 fights, I want to say, wow. coming into the year. Wow. And um, I, I won the, uh, I tried out for the ABF, which is the men's national, US men's national, and I think I lost in the, uh, I, forget, I think the regionals. I lost in the regionals. Scott Bernie, mm-hmm. a Michigan tough fighter, put you in the telephone booth and you got to fight in the whole fight. But um, then I went to the Gold Gloves and I actually went all the way to the Nationals and won that. Then I went to the Eastern Trials to stay busy and I won that too. So I had two bids into the uh, Olympic Trials. Okay. And uh, so I get into the Olympic Trials and I had to fight uh, Bradley Martinez. He was like a, uh, a veteran in the amateur at that time. He was always ranked number one or two. And um, I had to fight him. I beat him. And the next fight, I had to fight the rank number one, the the, 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 best, the legend, you know, since the last Olympian in 92. he been there the whole time, rank number one from 92, I was 96. Wow. Albert Guardado. Oh, yeah. And um, what happened was I was up on the scorecard to him, and um, he did, he punched me. as the first time it ever happened in my life. It just so happened in this fight. He punched me in my jaw, and it went out of place. You know how you can get yeah. out of jaw, and I got a face. Most bit. definitely, yeah. So this is new for me, so... You know, I'm panicking at the time, so he starts to go up on point, and he ended up beating me uh, by three punches from 12 to 9. Wow. So I fell to the losing bracket, and I had to fight Killer Hakeem Gallardo. He was uh, he was pretty good. He was, he was called Killer. That was his nickname. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he had over 100-something fights with just a very few win- uh, losses. So um, he beat me, and I thought I actually thought I won that fight, but he beat me by like three punches as well. So anyway, the... Um, they head off to the box office in the, in the uh, beginning of Olympic camp and um, Killer does something. I think he got in trouble for for something in camp. But anyway, they called me in to take his place and um, that was a hell of a learning experience. When my very first day, I had to box Zaire Raheem, the 119-pound champion. So oh, really? Yeah. Whole bunch of swag, whole bunch of style, could punch. So um, from that day forward, man, I just was a sponge and I learned everything I could learn from him, Floyd, um, you name it, man. Uh, they, 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 that was a squad. Fernando Vargas, Antonio Torres, Dave yes, Jones, Deb Judah, Eric Morrill. It was just, it was so many world champions. I think eight of them came out of that class. Yes, indeed. I was just the, I was the youngest there at 17 years old. Wasn't even supposed to be there because I was only boxing a little over a year and a half. So I was just a sponge, man, just soaking up all the game I could get. Cause um, I noticed also, man, that uh, you and Floyd end up traveling together from what Michigan all the way to um to Vegas. Yeah, well, what happened was when in 2000 when I turned pro, I got a phone call from uh, Frank Warren, and um, I told him that I would uh sleep on that, that that choice to make if I was going to turn pro with him or not and uh, the next day Floyd and uh, James Prince from Rap-A-Lot okay. his manager at the time they called me on three way and um, their deal sounded much better and uh, just in the to be living with Floyd uh, under his wing that was, that was kind of like a, a better package than what Frank Warren was offering yes indeed man next it. morning I, I flew off to, um, to Vegas to, to live with Floyd and be his uh, protege. Okay. And I signed the management deal with them. Yes, indeed. And, uh, Floyd, a lot of people don't know Floyd, man, especially back then, man. He, I remember him in uh, Cleveland. I met him for the first time <laughs> and how, um, how if he think you can fight, he definitely going to give you your props, man. And he, oh, and, he yeah. and he gonna hang around you, and he gonna he gonna want to know, and and if he could help, he would help, you know. Especially in, back then, I haven't seen him in almost twenty years, but I'm sure, you know, from hearing from how y'all you guys are still in contact with each other, and um, and uh, I, I I know how he was, man. He definitely, if he know you can go, he gonna try to lend a hand. Right, right. That's him. That's him exactly. So um, now let's bring it up to to. You coming back, you stop fighting for a while, then you come back and you decide to go pro at the age of what? what was you 35? 37. 37. 
man, you inspired me. When watching you do that made me get myself together, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was a whole bunch of Thanks. motivational energy, man. That yes, was, indeed, yeah, man. You that, you that. I, a lot of people got a tape and change their bodies in that period, man. Everybody used to hit me like, man, you don't know how much man. you changed my life. Hey, I lost bruh. 50 pounds, I lost this. Exactly, my girlfriend man. left me again. Oh, man, you made us wake up, brother. For real, man. Uh, explain that experience and how was that for you, man? And how, how did you feel? And, and, and how was that experience coming back at the age of 37 as a professional? It was, uh, it was, it was something that needed to happen, especially for me spiritually, because I was headed down a, a bad path. Mm-hmm. You know, we all do it, you know, every now and then. But some people will be years. Some some just might be a couple of days. But mine was years and years and years of going down the wrong path. And, you know, and I could have been better at something else. And um, I chose, you know, just a regular job. And, you know, just, I knew the sport was calling me and needed me. But I had too much to offer to it. But um, chose a regular job where I could, you know, work and then come home and, you know, fix me a drink and sit on the couch and watch TV until the next morning and go to work. Right. And um, we got tired of, you know, the abuse on the body, keep, you know, putting those drinks and coffee in your system and, mm-hmm. you know, the, the shit that the regular world sees it. So, uh, yeah, I just got to, I started training in 22. I retired in 2001. Mm-hmm. After a death in the family, I went home for the funeral. Kind of, I was already homesick, and uh, you know, missing my city. So it, it, it just kind of like ended up sitting me down, and that's that's part of the reason why I stopped fighting. So 2001 I retired, and I got a call about 2012 to train a fighter, and um, that, that kind of woke me up a little bit. And uh, you know, in the gym, you know, I touch on the bags, and then people were watching. They're like, "Man, you still got it, man. Your coach can, your coach can still fight." So. You know, just hearing that little stuff was just playing Steve and, and my subconscious. When I got to um, Cincinnati a few years later um, to train Jamil Herring, he's the world champion right now, and uh, Raymond Williams was a former, both of them were former U.S. Olympians. I was training them for their um, Showtime fight. Okay. State. And um, AB seen me hitting the bag. He like, man, you tripping, man, training those fighters, man. You need to fight, man. We ain't training no more fighters, man. You better fight. I'm like he, he sounds serious. He was right. he's loud. He like in front of the whole gym got real loud. Man, fuck them fighters. <laughs> I'm like I'm like okay, what's he talking about? So right. I said it must look good or something. He because if this AD said it, you know this three time about to be a four time world champion right. this time. So I'm like it must look kind of good on the bag. Well, like, maybe I need to film this and look cute and look like exactly. That. That um, that kind of like was what woke me up, and I I had uh, had to lose like sixty pounds in the process to um, get from one ninety one, my biggest, to uh, one twenty six. And um, yeah, it was uh, it was a long journey, man. I learned a lot about myself, right? I learned a lot about the sport, and uh, yeah, that um, I needed that. That was right on time. It probably saved, uh, probably saved. Like maybe 20, 30 years off my life, man. I probably added on to it. Man, you um, you definitely inspired me, brother, with that with that happened when you did that, man. You um, I saw you. You was here in DC when you did that. Am I correct? Mm, yeah, 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 man. Um, so a lot of people don't know the history with uh Cincinnati and in DC. Uh, you know, our biggest things at one point we were rivals. And then we understood that it was a bigger rival on the West Coast. Right. And that's that almighty California team. Uh-huh. So we had to figure out a way how to stop them jokers. So we ended up coming together and uh, building a relationship, man. Like a lot of people don't know, um, uh, AB, this is like his second home. Right. You know, he, you know he, he's been coming to D.C. since he was a little since boy. Yes, yeah. indeed. And so... Um, and, and what made you start training AB and getting back on that side and joining the team again and, and became a trainer? Because uh, as I'm seeing throughout media, everybody's noticing uh, are you on the team from different media sources? They all recognize your background. And, and, and a lot of people is highlighting that. They like this is not just an average trainer who's uh, just want to train people. This guy 
has an accolades, has a, a, a outstanding amateur career, and I know he has a lot to offer. AB, what got you on the team as a, a as a trainer? Well, what it was is uh, after that uh, the Pacquiao fight. Um, he had sent me a text, and, and I don't know if it, he was meaning it towards boxing or life itself, but he sent me a text to GT, I need you. And uh, so I put myself around him. And um, now that I look back at it, maybe it was strictly for, for the life stuff because he was, he was headed down a, a road that, uh, you know, could have crashed and burn real fast, you know, and this might not even last a year, you know, mm-hmm. been six months, and he might not even be here no more, or he, he might not even be in fighting condition at all. So uh, maybe he maybe he just needed me for life, but uh, I think what happened was, I'm just as if I'm guessing, because uh, he had to tell you, you know, how I actually made the team. But uh, yeah, so um, we started going to fight. We went to Sean Porter, Earl Spit, out of LA, that was my first night with him. Uh, you know, we sitting ringside watching the fight. We talking the fight, and I think he kind of like starting to pick up. Like, man, this dude GP know a lot about the sport that a lot of people don't know. Because you know, certain people know stuff, right? And even people that's deep into the sport that that's been in it for thirty years, they might not even know some right. of the stuff that somebody else knows. You know what I'm saying? That's facts. Like, like they can see things and, and spot things, and they can solve issues right. really better than others. See deeper than the surface, basically. It man. is. You right. So we watching the fights, and um, I think we go to Tank fight after that. Uh, Tank fought Gamboa in Atlanta, December. Yeah, December twenty eighth, somewhere around there. And um, I'm gonna sit ringside, point out stuff. Like, man, I know he. I get. Mean, I kind of like he saying it, but I could see him like at all. Like, man, this dude really know this stuff, man. And he calling shots that the other person gonna throw before they throw it, and he sees how to solve it. So I think that ultimately is what led him to be like, man, I'm about to put DP on the team, man. He's about to be about to turn it and start to, you know, figure out how. And he said, you know, he didn't let me know. I didn't find out the last minute that, um, you know, I was going to be in this corner. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a question he really got to answer. But uh, right. that's how it started, you know, him saying that he need me and I got around him, you know, to start to help back. And I think I did it pretty good job helping him out getting to this point. Yeah, you did great, man. Um, also, man, uh, me and my brother always talk about boxing IQ. Who has some of the highest boxing IQs? And in my opinion, you between you and Ronald Sims. Ronald who? Ronald Sims. I can't get the last name. Sims. Oh, Sims. Got you. Yeah, Ronald Sims. Man, y'all have yeah, some of the... Gr- Best boxing IQ that I know in the sport altogether. Damn, I appreciate that, man. That's that's, that's a that's a huge compliment. Right it there. is, man, and, and it's well deserved and earned because uh, you got you guys are real students of the sport. You know, you take it serious and you you still focus on the fundamentals, which is very important, and which a lot of that's fighters not, are losing. One. Yeah, but one. And 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 is and, and is and is, uh, is is great to see that you know we still around and able to share uh, uh, the fundamentals to these fighters up and coming because everybody wants to come out off the break trying to be the, the Floyd Mayweather, but they don't know Floyd is has one of the greatest fundamentals in boxing. Right. You know, if you pay attention to him, you know, I wish the youth right. look and notice that. You know, but uh, man, all off the fundamentals. Yeah, yeah, man. All from the fundamentals. But um, what's what's in the future for you, man? What's in the future for you? Are you planning on training other fighters, or are you just going to lock in with A B and help them get a world title, and then focus on that later? What is your uh future endeavors, man? Uh, I'm really I'm open. I'm open. I believe that I can uh train other fighters. And still be able to um, lock in, you know, with, with where I started with AB, and you know, on the path he's taking, that's, that's um, inevitable. It's gonna happen. He's gonna be, become a five-time and six and seven, hopefully an eight-time world champion here soon. Um, he's uh, he's locked in, and uh, you know, I think he's out having some fun right now, taking a little break, couple of days out, because it was four months long. Yeah, I didn't expect him to to come 
back again in until Monday. I wasn't gonna let him do that. You right. Know, it, you gotta, you gotta let the body come exactly. Down that. You know, break. Especially the mind. Exactly. You know, like mentally, and then you know, us as black people, we have to deal with so much just being black. Period. That we right. need mental breaks. You know what I'm saying? From 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 whatever. Just going outside every day is mentally challenging. So. Yeah, for him to go for a grueling four month, you know, I mean, instantly overnight cold turkey, stopping all the bad stuff and getting all on the good stuff. He needs a little break, you know, two days off, and, and we're gonna start recovering. So we're gonna start, you know, the jacuzzi and the sauna and the That's steam right. rooms and the, and the cold bath, you know, to break the body back down and try to get back down to zero. I know it's not gonna go, but he he trained so hard so long, but um. Yeah, we're gonna um, do that and then we're gonna slowly start back working out but um yeah I'm, I'm open to anything I, I actually got like a, um, something I got my fingers crossed on <clears throat> um about some, some new work that's coming up here soon and I think it's gonna happen I've been manifesting it for, for forever so I'll be uh hopefully I ain't gonna say hopefully pretty soon here I'll be um we'll, I'll be letting you know the, the great news that's about okay. to happen most definitely, bro. I look forward to hearing it, man. Uh, I think you did an awesome job. I watched you from day one when y'all first started training. I noticed how you changed the diet with them and you gave them more life foods. You know, f- you know, we going in the vegan route, and uh, that's you know, I, as you know, I've been a vegan for now five years. So, oh, okay. Uh, uh, yeah. and, and to I see to see you doing that, man, and and, and add more vegetables and. Uh, fruits to his diet plan, man, was, was, would also change this. You know, a lot of people don't know our food is, uh, the energy that we take in. So we getting life forces. We're going to, we're going to bring out life forces. And, and I noticed that, that attitude towards that brother has changed too, man. And I, I, and, and I was telling Kimi, my brother Hakeem, I was like, man, GT definitely, um, uh, it's playing a part, man. You know, because you you you're much older than AB, so yeah, eleven years. Eleven years, so you know, it's a lot of wisdom comes with that too, and it's and and it's not too old for him. Is enough to give him the, right. the proper advice where he won't be like, oh, that's outdated or something like that. You still, we right. still, we still in season, you know. Right. So, uh, man, uh, brother, you continue up the great work, man, and I thank you for uh, coming on here. Uh, you'll be our first you are you are our first um fighter that's not from dc to be on the dc boxing legends podcast oh yeah let me let me speak on dc too man so oh, okay coming from cincinnati you know we recognize one of those threat cities you know and then you got philadelphia you got dc so it's, it's always been nothing but uh love man i'm just i'm speaking for the whole city the whole sport coming from our city that we respect the shit out of the DC area fighters, man. Y'all, uh, y'all definitely come to fight. Y'all come to tip top shade. Y'all got swag. Y'all black like us. Yes, indeed. And, um, it, it ain't, it ain't nothing but respect, man. And, and anytime we seen we had to go against a DC fighter, man, it was game on, man. We yeah. had to lock in because you got to be on your shit. So that was nothing. I'm pretty sure it's probably the same. It's probably a mutual feeling for me. It is, guys. bro. It definitely and, um, is. It, it, it was a beauty to experience at all the, national tournaments and, and it, it just was uh, fun to be a part of it and then when we got to go to international stuff and we teammates with y'all uh, roommates with y'all uh, you know that, that was even better man where you could have fun with a DC like me and Sean Johnson we were teammates over in Thailand like we ain't gotta fight each other now we now we can be cool cause y'all just like us man so yes, indeed. it ain't nothing but love from, from Cincinnati and the rest of the whole country to, to y'all man I know they respected y'all and they, was, they feared y'all you know being up against y'all when it was time to fight and that's likewise, man, for Cincinnati, man. Y'all had some some brothers that was that was amazing, man. Ricardo Wims, uh, 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 you had Craig, Craig, um, Dante Craig, man, yourself, what's his name? Timmy Austin. Y'all had some bad boys that come <laughs> from Cincinnati, man. It, it was like yeah, uh, man. you know, you knew if you didn't come with your A game, you was going out. Right. You wasn't gonna make it to the championship or it or win it. Right. And so, same, same, uh, same yes, indeed, brother. With the mutual respect, man. Uh, please tell AB, man. Best of luck. Continue to stay focused, man. Uh, and, and and only things in the way of him becoming another world champion is himself, man. 
And I know he he Thanks. has a good man be- beside him. So appreciate that. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Gerald Tucker, DC Boxing Thanks. Legends Podcast. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Bro. Anytime, brother. DC Boxing Legend Podcast. 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 DC Boxing Legend Podcast.